My name is Simon DeGraff and in this presentation we're going to look at how to manipulate the seasonality of reproduction. So why would you want to manipulate the breeding season? Well, there are a number of reasons. First, you might want to spread production around the year. This could be to take advantage of seasonal price premiums. It could be to take advantage of periods in the year where there's there's more feed or cheaper feed. Uh, in some species, there's a uh, performance benefit due to certain rules and regulations, like in the thoroughbred industry. Now, it's really important to know that it's much easier to advance the next breeding season rather than extend the current one. And there's a need for a refractory or, or rest period from one to the next uh, as well. So it's not something that you can do absolutely instantly either. Now, the way in which you would manipulate a breeding season falls under the umbrella of applied reproduction. And we're going to go through some of those applied reproduction techniques now. So there's several potential methods which you could use. The use of gonadotrophins, so these are things like FSH or ECG, which cause trophics, a building of the, the gonads. You could use GnRH, so if you remember that is gonadotrophin releasing hormone, and the gonadotrophin releasing hormone is the first hormone in the HPG axis, in that cascade of hormonal regulation or hormones going from one structure to the next which underpin all of reproductive activity. So if GnRH is right at the top, manipulation of that you would think would cause some kind of uh, incredible effects further on down the track um, in terms of breeding uh, out of season. We might use so social manipulation. So this is where we utilize the, the social cues or interactions between the males and the females. This is where you separate the males and the females and then bring them back together. You could manipulate day length itself. Now, we've already learned how day length is the proximate obligatory stimulus, which uh, enables us to, um, to regulate season or have that effect on seasonality. So if you can actually control day length itself, you don't need to worry about anything else because you can tell the animal what time of the year it is, even if it is actually a completely different time of the year. And the last one, and one of probably the most relevant to um, you today, is the use of melatonin and the commercial product known as Regulin here in Australia, which can be used to uh, breed sheep out of season. Let's go into this first one, the administration of gonadotrophins. So the use of PMSG, or its modern term, is ECG, which is equine chorionic gonadotrophin, um, and or follicle stimulating hormone in the non-breeding season. So you can actually take a, a ewe, which is in an estrus, you can put a cedar into her, and then when you pull that cedar out after 12 to 14 days, um, you put a PMSG injection in at the, at the same time or multiple injections of FSH. And you can take that animal from an estrus to estrus. And you're able to do this because you are artificially stimulating that reproductive axis. So you are, are making the animal's gonads think that it is getting signals from the HPG axis basically in increasing levels of FSH and the progesterone priming that it might need in order to have the correct display of estrus and CL maintenance. So you're tricking the animal into thinking that this is occurring and it could start to cycle and the animal could potentially get pregnant. Now, the effect in effectiveness of this treatment is mixed depending on what stage of an estrus you apply it. So if you're deep in an estrus, so this means really not long after estrus activity has ceased, you will get around 50% or even less of um, the ewes really responding and coming into estrus. You do it a bit later, it's up to 50 to 80%. And if you do it very close to the actual breeding season itself, then you're going to get um, even more of the ewes coming in into estrus. So what does that show you? Uh, 
this particular table, it shows you that the closer you get to the normal breeding season, the greater the effectiveness of this particular technique. And the second one that I'm going to talk about is administration of gonadotrophin releasing hormone. So if you gave repeat injections of GnRH to stimulate the pulsatility that you would get from the GnRH pulse generator to cause an increase in the levels of FSH and LH activity in that axis. Now, one of the products that used to be around was called Fertigil. I genuinely don't know whether that's, that's still on the market, but the idea was is that if you gave uh, these repeat injections, you might get some stimulus. Now, the, the, that can work to some degree in a very short over a very short time frame, but very quickly, if you give GnRH uh, in a long acting or a, a systemic long-term way, what you do rather than stimulating the HPG axis is you decrease uh, or suppress the axis and you do decrease gonadotrophin secretion in the majority of species, in, including sheep. Now I've said there that this is due to downregulation of receptors, but recent research has essentially said we don't know why it really occurs, um, whether it's because you're overwhelming the receptors, whether you're downregulating them, not entirely sure, but the fact of the matter is that it does not work if you give GnRH um, in pulses, if you give it in large doses, if you give it um, in uh, implants, it's ineffective, it's impractical. I include it in here because it's something which makes sense logically that if you are able to give artificial pulses of GnRH, you should be able to activate that axis. In effect, it doesn't really work. So you can now completely forget about this one, um, but it, it's there just for your, uh, your background knowledge. You should, use of social factors. So this is the RAM effect that we've spoken about in one or two of the other presentations as part of this series of talks on sheep reproduction. So you can use the RAM effect to advance the breeding season of ewes by up to two to three months. Now what it requires is you need to isolate the sexes for at least six weeks beforehand um, for, what we, we always say about two kilometers, uh, and then you need to reintroduce them uh, in one fell swoop and make sure that none of the males are, are getting out or accidentally mixing with the, uh, with the ewes beforehand, otherwise it, it just won't work properly. Now what can happen is that some of the, the first estrus periods are silent, or you might get some, some short cycles. Um, this can be because there's not enough uh, progesterone priming which is, has occurred. Uh, if you really wanted to make sure that they came in the first time, you might want to or give them a cedar before you introduce the, the rams. So give them a cedar, uh, then introduce the rams and you would have that progesterone priming. So their first estrus would be a normal one. They would ovulate and, uh, and you would get a certainly a better response if, if you did it, did it like that. Almost nobody ever does because it's, a, it's more hassle and it's, it's more expensive, but suffice to say that use of the RAM effect is an effective way of bringing forward the, um, the breeding season of use in a, a reasonable percentage of the flock, but it's, it's not perfect um, and it, it sometimes doesn't work um, as effectively as what you, you would have hoped for. Um, so there are, there are other ways in which uh, you can go about doing things which offer you a little bit more shorty. Now, if you're wondering how that male effect works, you can see here on, on well, let's have a look at the, the graph on the left. Uh, this is the, the ram effect. The one on the right is actually a, a female effect. But up the side we've got, in the, on the y-axis, we've got plasma LH. So this is showing levels of LH in the blood of the, of the female. And over on the x-axis, we have time related to when males are introduced. So in the preceding six hours before the males are introduced, you can see that the amount of LH pulsatility is minimal. But as soon as a male is introduced after a period of um, the males being uh, withdrawn from, from the females, is you know, at least six weeks, 
you can see that immediately there is a response in the hypothalamus and that GnRH pulse generator just starts pushing out GnRH, which has the effect of increasing LH levels in the, the blood because LH is released as a response to GnRH levels coming through. Now, whilst it's not quite as profound in terms of the amplitude of the pulses, you can also see that this happens with the RAM when females are introduced after a, a long period of, of them being isolated. And whilst we've learned that males are not completely seasonal, that there is some seasonality in the, in the merino, and that uh, this is one of the reasons why during the, the normal breeding season, you get a higher libido, higher testosterone, and higher sperm output as well from the males. Now here we see an overall picture of what happens when you utilize the RAM effect. So on the y-axis, again, we've got percentage of ewes ovulating, and you can see that during the breeding season, you've got that up around 100%. Then during the non-breeding season, it falls down to almost zero, and then up again. Now this is a uh, an, an oversimplification, there are always going to be a few ewes which are probably cycling even during the what we would consider the non-breeding season. Likewise, there's going to be a few ewes that aren't cycling during the breeding season. That's just the nature of reproduction. There's biological variation and not everything does what you think that it's going to do. But as an overall rule, this is essentially what is happening. Now, if you utilise the RAM effect, what you can do is you can bring forward that beginning of the season. And you will also, just as a, as a side effect, you will have synchronized cycles. It won't be perfect synchronization. It's not gonna be the same as if you were using a cedar and then using ECG, like what you would use in an artificial breeding program, which will bring animals into season. Uh, but it won't be as synchronized as that, but you will get a synchronization of the of the cycles. Other than social cues, we've got the manipulation of day length. So decreasing from the equinox for short day breeders is what can be done to bring those animals on faster. But the fact of the matter is in Australia, this is almost completely irrelevant because we graze animals outdoors, we're not holding animals inside of large sheds, um, so we're, we're unable to control the light. It's much easier in a long day breeder because you can get lights and just leave them on for when it gets dark, but it's, uh, it's difficult when you've got short day breeders. Um, you, you can't do the opposite. But again, if you are going to be manipulating day length, if there is anybody listening to this in uh, in Europe where you would potentially be able to bring your animals indoors and um, and control the what lights they're exposed to, it, it does work best, as always, close, closest to the anticipated breeding season. Now, just as a, a little reminder of how this transcription of photo period works, we did learn in one of the other presentations about the entire pathway that takes place from the eye right through to the, the gonads, um, how that, that entire pathway of activation works in long day and short days. But let's just refresh that here. So here we've got a sheep, we've got its brain, and then we've got our little uh, pineal gland in there as well as the hypothalamus in, in red. So this is just what's occurring normally. We've got our day length or rather night length being registered. And we've got our pineal gland, which is taking the neural inputs. So remember it's a neuroendocrine transducer. So it's taking our neural inputs and turning them into an endocrine output. So the level of melatonin affects the GnRH pulse generator, which has a flow on effect on the pituitary, so it controls the amount of FSH and LH, and FSH and LH control what is outputted by the gonads. 
So when there are long days and short nights, we have quite low number of pulses of LH, FSH levels are low. But as the days get shorter, so the nights are getting longer, we have an increase in the pulsatility of GnRH, which is reflected by much higher levels of FSH and much higher levels of LH as well. Now, the way in which we can trick the body into thinking, or the use body into thinking that this is occurring, that you are having these short days or very long nights, is to administer melatonin. So in Australia, this is referred to as Regulin, that's the registered product, and it's an implant which has a constant release of melatonin over a long period of time. And that causes the, the same effect as if the days were getting much, much shorter, it's high levels of FSH, and high levels of LH pulsatility, so active gonads in other ways. So testes working really well if it's implanted into a male and a for a U, you are going to get that U cycling. So what are the key points that I'd like you to take home from these slides in this particular presentation? Well, I'd like you to know that breeding seasons can be adjusted, but you can't alter them completely you can adjust them by many different ways. The fact of the matter is though, is that melatonin is the simplest and it's the most cost effective way of adjusting season and reproductive activity of sheep. This is the way in which you would utilize it and certainly SIVA can give you much more information about this, uh, but essentially you would implant the melatonin behind the ear, delivers melatonin for around 80 days. You can advance the breeding season by around about 8 to 12 weeks before its normal start. You can utilise it in conjunction with the RAM effect to have an even stronger impact. And one of the great things about utilising Regulant is that whilst it increases the twinning rate, it doesn't appear to have an excess effect on levels of uh, FSH to the point that you're getting lots and lots of triplets or anything along those lines.